thank you very much for coming. Um, how many, before I get started into the flow, how many people here are working in an agency right now? Yeah, cool. How many people have worked in an agency and hated it? Yeah, yeah, no, up, down, yeah, cool. Uh, great, okay, well, hopefully this stuff will be useful then. A lot of it is fairly uh, personal to the experiences I've had over the last three years, um, but uh, I struggle to find information about a lot of this stuff, so um, hopefully some of it will be useful, and I'm going to try and leave as much time at the end for really specific, particular questions that people are struggling with, because I know I had a lot of them. Um, so, my name is Lily Dart. Uh, I'm the Head of Service Design for DXW, and I want to talk today a bit about um, our experiences over the last three years doing agile development, um, and what we learned specifically to help improve client relationships, and what that did was allow us to deliver our agile projects better. Um, so DXW is a small agile agency and we specialise in public sector digital. Um, what this means in practice is that we work with a lot of large, hairy government organisations and they're a bit uh, slow moving and rumbly. Um, and within those organisations we work with small, underfunded and time poor teams. Um, and none of these things are often a very good mix with delivering uh, in an agile way. Um, but we've got about 14 people now, we've been around for about six years, so we have, we have certainly been growing and getting to a better place. Um, but because these things weren't really a very good mix with Agile, we uh, began with Agile Fall. It was some kind of bastardised mix-up of uh, Waterfall and Agile. Um, and we were using Agile and Lean internally, and we really believed that that was kind of the right way to do things for software development. Um, but as ever, we struggled to get client buy-in. Um, we were hindered by procurement teams, and uh, where we did get sort of partial buy-in from clients, um, we couldn't always stick to our Agile approaches. We'd come up against some kind of problem in a project, and we'd have to make some kind of compromise. Um, but we did believe that Agile is, is better for our clients, as well as for being good for software development and for us as developers. Um, we did believe that Agile was better. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail, but, you know, it, it is less risky. Uh, there's less upfront com uh, commitment to what you're going to build. So if you're building something wrong, then you find it out pretty quickly. Um, and the iterative cycles give you much better visibility and response time for problems, regardless of the flavour of Agile it is that you're using. Um, it is faster, you know, when you've got those stakeholders who really want you to be making progress quickly, you can show them things and engage them a lot faster, not even to mention the actual users of the product. Um, and it's cheaper, it's often cheaper, because it gives you the chance to really think about what it is you're building, you know, what is it that you really need here and what is it that you can chuck out. Um, so we believed that it was the right solution, but we were struggling, uh, we weren't getting it right, um, and I looked to the community for help. Um, and what I found was a lot of good advice for product teams, for internal teams, um, basically for people who had ownership of their own projects. And we didn't really have that because we had an interface with clients and they were the owners of the projects and they weren't part of our organisational culture. Um, so I went to some agile agencies and I spoke to them about uh, what they were doing and how they felt stuff was going. And they were actually pretty frustrated too, you know. Um, come in if you want to, it's totally cool. Um, they were pretty frustrated too. Um, they felt like you know, they were compromising a lot as well. I heard a lot of, you know, we have these problems and we have to compromise. Um, and they were doing things like they were having to do upfront spec work. Um, they were having to kind of complete features that they'd committed to, even though they were out of sprint. Um, you know, there were lots of uh, kind of little problems that they'd come up against, against the expectations of their clients versus how they wanted to be delivering stuff. Um, and they had lots of reasons as to why they thought it wasn't working. Uh, none of them were particularly consistent. Um, some people said that because their clients were off-site, it was never going to work because you know, they were working in remote locations. Um, some people said that clients genuinely don't really care about how it gets delivered. As long as there's a thing at the end of it, then they're quite happy with that, um, which you know, I'm, I'm not sure about. Um, but, you know, some people sort of confided in me to say that they never really thought, even people who were doing agency agile were saying agencies can't really do proper agile, um, you know, that that agency model will never really be able to align itself to agile processes, um, unless it happens that your clients have lots and lots of money to throw away to make it happen for you. Um, and I was a bit disheartened at this point. Um, but I knew that there were some agencies doing it really well. You know, there's a very small selection, but people like Clear Left in Brighton were definitely doing you know, uh, agency agile in an effective way, um, albeit on a slightly grander scale. 
Um, so I felt like it was something that we could do better. So I thought about the context that Agile has to work in in an agency, and when and if it does work, it does just have to be different than it would be in a product team. Um, and that's because we've got different pressures. You know, so we're often operating on slim profit margins, um, and we need to do things like find the time for sales and writing proposals. Uh, we have different relationships. You know, we often start our client relationships with a sales pitch, um, and that kind of puts things in a certain tone. We're also generally accountable to our clients and not to the end users of the things that we're building, which puts us in quite a difficult situation sometimes. Finally, there are just some different expectations about agency behavior than perhaps the ones we'd like. Um, we don't always have good reputations as a collective. Uh, it's rare that an organization managed to have a really kind of a long-standing, healthy relationship with an agency because our working relationships don't tend to last that long. And there's lots of reasons that that happens, but some of those things are that um, we're often seen as someone to negotiate money with. Um, we're seen as someone to hold accountable if something's really going wrong. Um, and that's not a very collaborative space to start your journey with. And equally, those, uh, those things that clients find valuable, those agency norms that they might be expecting to see when they start interacting with you, um, don't work for us either. You know, those things like fixed time and scope and cost, um, it seems to offer some certainty over what's going to be delivered, but we can't give them that certainty for a very good reason. Um, but that's comforting to a client, right? Uh, upfront spec work is another really good example. This really reduces the need for trust. You know, what's the point of generating uh, a kind of trusting, healthy relationship with your agency when they've already delivered what they're basically going to deliver, right? Um, so why go to the effort of finding someone that you can really work with collaboratively? And finally, this idea again of deferred risk. You know, this is comforting to people, particularly if they're working in, in a blame-heavy culture. You know, if something goes wrong and a head has to roll, it's probably better that your agency gets fired than you do. So there were lots of contextual problems. Um, but there were also some real kind of everyday problems that we were having in, in trying to deliver things in an agile way. Um, and uh, they were, there, there were a few of them. So the first one was that um, us and our clients really had mismatched expectations about how projects would happen. Um, they did things like expecting us to do work out of sprint, like calling us at the last hour and going, actually, we need this thing right, right now. And we weren't really set up to work like that. Or perhaps they wanted all of the pages of their site designed in Photoshop before they signed anything off. Um, you know, they had these little expectations around having worked with agencies before, um, and, and we couldn't align to them. Uh, they had misunderstandings about the Agile process. Uh, they didn't really understand why Agile was valuable to them or their projects. Um, and they often saw Agile as something that the developers had to worry about. Um, we ended up with some adversarial relationships with some of our clients. Uh, clients or procurement teams pressured us to be faster and cheaper, as you often get in an agency situation. And they would do things like hold us to deadlines, even if they didn't deliver sign-off on time or keep to their commitments. And finally, we had a lot of products, uh, conflicts over product design, and a lot of this was me. Um, you know, we would regularly disagree over the best solution. We'd be saying, but this is best practice. And they'd be saying, but this is what I want. And we were both kind of talking at odds uh, about it in a way that we couldn't resolve very easily. So uh, with these things in mind, however, with these kind of particular problems and an awareness of the context and maybe uh, what the client journey was before getting to us and their experiences with other agencies, uh, we kept on iterating our process over about a year. Um, and it wasn't always smooth, but eventually we got to a place where Agile was working for us and it kind of crept us on us a bit. But one day we went, actually, you know, this stuff is this really working for us. Uh, and it's working for us and for our clients. And the way we're delivering now is, is undeniably Agile. Um, so I want to talk a bit about how we achieved that. So the first problem that we had was mismatched expectations. Um, clients wanted uh, out of sprint work, or they wanted all their pages designed up front. Um, and we decided that we needed to set expectations about what the process was going to look like earlier and more consistently. And the reason that that's important is that a satisfying project experience is always going to be one that lives up to the client's expectations. 
Um, it doesn't matter how good the product is that you're delivering at the end of that. Uh, if their expectations have to be reset or reconsidered through that process, it's always going to have felt like a bumpy journey to them. So we consider the touch points in our client journey, much like we would uh, with users. You know, are we setting the right expectation at the right time? But there's a lot of them. You know, we've got calls and emails and briefs and proposals and pitches and contracts and meetings, so there's a lot to think about. Um, but I'm just going to focus on three of the major changes that we made today. So the first interaction that you're often going to have um, in a client project is being handed their project brief. Um, and briefs are the way that the client is setting expectation with us, right? It's their way of communicating that this is what they need from us. Um, and mostly, I think we find that those briefs just don't work for us out of the box. Um, you know, perhaps they've got a detailed specification. Perhaps they make assumptions about their users. Uh, perhaps the amount of work they're asking for isn't likely to add value to their organization. Um, and we saw quite a few of these briefs, and we struggled to deliver them in a way that was useful and good. Um, so we decided to be bold. Um, and we decided to challenge client briefs before we win the work, before we even propose for them. Uh, if we saw something that we didn't think we could work with, we'd tell them that up front. Um, and I know a lot of agencies who will make that challenge after they've won the work, or possibly in the proposal. Um, but I, and I get the motivation for that. Like I've done that as a freelancer myself as well. Uh, you don't want to start the conversation off on a sour point. But not challenging it can actually mean that you put the project in a really bad place because the client's gone to the effort of communicating to you what it is that they need. And instead of being upfront and communicating back again, what you're actually doing is unintentionally obscuring the fact that you're not really intending to deliver that thing that they want. So we decided to challenge our briefs when, when they weren't a good fit for us. And what we found was that it was just mo totally cool for the most part. Um, many clients are really genuinely willing to listen to feedback. Um, they might be nervous. Uh, they might be inexperienced with these kinds of projects. Perhaps they haven't written a brief like this before. They're happy to hear if there's a better option. Uh, some of them have even changed their briefs based on our feedback um, to quite high value projects. They have gone away and rewritten it and sent it all out to tender again. And thankfully we won. Um, but it, it will happen. Some people do care enough to actually make that extra effort. But some people won't. Um, you know, some people are just not going to be a good fit for you. And if they're not willing to listen to your feedback or your expertise in those very first interactions, uh, then they're probably quite a long way off agile collaborative thinking. Um, so you've got to consider at that point whether or not you should just end the conversation and say thank you, but no thank you. So the next touch point uh, is generally a proposal. Um, and these are about how we set expectations about what we're going to deliver. Um, and we had a look at ours, and we found that we weren't setting expectation about our process, really, just about a kind of epic -y, story ish kind of feature-led thing. Um, and we weren't showing in any way, shape, or form how our approach was really adding value, why the Agile thing mattered. So we, the first thing we considered was where does our process actually add value? And this is an exciting extract from one of our proposals. Um, so at the end of each sprint, you should have usable software that you can launch. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward statement, and we're not bigging anything up. Um, but for someone used to Waterfall, the regular releases uh, in Agile can actually be really empowering, particularly if you're under pressure to deliver quickly. Um, so this, we've kind of got bits like this uh, peppered throughout our proposals. Um, and they have the combined uh, value of setting practical expectations about the process, but also actually implying the value that we're delivering. Um, the second thing is where your principles add value. Um, I've never come across an Agile team that isn't strongly principled about the right way to deliver um, good software. Um, so what is it about your principles that actually makes that useful? You know, is it the Agile stuff? Is it user-centered? Is it service design oriented? Do you have some special approach to tech architecture that actually is really working for you? Um, you know, what does a good project look like to you guys? Um, so this is another exciting extract. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we say is that we set expectations both about what looks good to us and also about um, what a client should expect from maintaining a, a digital service or product. You know, you've got to keep on engaging with users. And we put this as a, we expect you to do this, um, you know, whether we're working on the project or not. Um, and you know, it kind of answers questions like, will we be able to get away with just doing one usability testing session? Because the answer is always going to be no. Um, so it helps to set a vibe and hopefully add some value to the life of the project, even if we're not in it. 
Um, and the final thing is about not accidentally making commitments. Uh, I think most of us know that if we're doing Agile, we can't kind of make firm commitments over time and features. But um, sometimes we do it by accident. I don't know if anyone's ever given someone an estimation and then found when they want to rework that estimation based on more information, um, the other person has really heard it subconsciously as a quote and they get quite upset uh, with the idea that that number might change. Um, so in trying to help them out, you've actually inadvertently set that expectation that they then need to go away and kind of reconsider themselves. Um, so we've got a way around this for um, uh, giving costs for projects, which we've got to do with procurement departments. Uh, we give a minimum project cost and a maximum project cost based on a set of assumptions. Um, and this uh, kind of gives them a best case and a worst case, right? Um, and if, we, if they get the budget for the maximum project cost and then we only spend for the minimum, then procurement's happy because we've saved them some money or, in a, or seemingly saved them some money. Um, so it gives them that, uh, that information that they need to work with without setting any firm commitments from their path. Contracts. Who's got a really boring contract? Oh, who knows what that contract looks like? Yeah? Cool. Um, so if you haven't even looked at your contract um, or haven't looked at it recently, contracts are supposed to be a tool for creating mutual understanding. That's their legal purpose, right? Um, and unfortunately, they're often only understood or read by lawyers. Um, but we decided to make our contracts more useful because we have to give them over anyway and wouldn't it be better if we just genuinely understood each other a little bit better? Um, so you can explain the language that you use day to day in a contract. It's quite a normal um, uh, legal practice to put definitions at the top of your document. What we've done is put the definitions of the agile language that we use and then that goes throughout the contract. Um, and it also goes through every single conversation that we have with a client, it goes through our proposals, it goes through every other touch point that we use. Um, so this is the language that we are using and it's defined in a plain English way in the contract. Um, I don't know if you can quite see the link, but we've published our contracts on, on GitHub. Um, so if you want to go and have a look at the full one, you can do. Um, and we also explain how the process will work. If we're working in an agile environment, then we're probably selling a combination of process and expertise rather than deliverables. Um, so it's kind of right that your contract should explain what your process is. Um, so this is a clause about um, when a story can be started and what we need in order to get that story started. Um, and the, the whole of the contract is basically this is what an individual sprint will look like for you. Um, and it just has a lot of information in it that would be difficult to verbalise in one or two meetings with the clients, but becomes a really useful reference tool. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do this, you can't use legalese because it does need to be uh, human readable. Um, and you also need to make sure that you're actually uh, defining any ag agile and also technical language. You know, just remember that uh, humans also don't have those words in their vocabulary usually. Cool. Okay. So... We also had a problem with adversarial relationships. Um, clients wanted us cheaper and faster. They weren't keeping their commitments. And the thing is that Agile really only works with trust and mutual goals. That's, that's what the team makeup needs to be. So we decided that we needed to, to give more and also ask quite a bit more of our clients. Um, and we also made a decision to screen out people that we couldn't work with. And the client relationship in an agile environment just has to be collaborative to succeed. You know, people need to be working towards the same goal. But that means that on some level, at least, we need to be able to share principles and goals with clients to be able to make that team unit. So we started to consider the sales process as a two-way interview. You know, were we really able to align goals with this potential client? Or did we, could we tell that we were just not speaking the same language? And unfortunately, you do have to pick the right client to get the right outcomes. Um, this is difficult because sometimes we turn down work, and that's really painful when you're an agency. Um, uh, sometimes we choose not to pitch for things, but you have to pick that uh, client that you can align with because if you don't, there's real impacts. Um, you know, the pressure that you put on team members when you've got an adversarial relationship with someone is very high. Um, the reputational risks of bad outcomes uh, when you can't decide on a good route forward for a project are also high. So how do we establish a good fit? Well, the first thing we want to know is how they're measuring their outcomes. You know, do they care about money? 
Do they care about user satisfaction? Do they care about the number of complaints that they're getting and reducing it? Or perhaps, as many clients, uh, they don't measure at all. Um, and that's a bit of a problem, and it's something you need to know up front, because if they're not measuring at all, what are you going to be judged against? You know, is it going to be the color palette that the CEO really wants? And if you don't use it, then you're going to be judged uh, you know, badly for it. Um, similarly, what are their organization's priorities? So what does the organizational culture value? You know, if they do really care about money, are they going to be likely to want to cut corners on the process? Or do they have a really good understanding of investor improve? Um, and also, it's good to just remember to ask what the motivator for the particular project is. Um, I was talking to someone about this last night, and they actually mentioned that uh, they didn't find out till later that the motivator for a particular project was a legal battle. Um, you know, and, uh, and asking that question that can give you some important context for the kind of pressures that surround a particular project. Um, and your client is more than just the person who pays the bills. They are a human, mostly. Um, and they want you cheaper and faster, and you want more money and more time, and it can be really easy to forget that they are human beings with their own pressures and needs when you're having those conversations, and I know I've done it a lot. Um, you know, they are genuinely, for the most part, creative, expert, and invested in their own project. They care about the outcomes of their projects. Um, but they are going to have different pressures and different organizational needs and different skills to you, and you have to keep reminding yourself of that. So we decided that we needed to be a bit more empathetic to our clients' needs and experiences, just like we would if they were users of a product, that we're, because they are users of a product that we're producing, right? Um, and in order to genuinely treat a client as a team member, to have that unit, we needed to be empathetic. So what are their needs and experiences? Well, it's useful to know who they report to, you know, who is their boss, what's their relationship like with them. Um, what do they as a person want out of the project? Usually it's a bit different to what the organization wants. Um, do they want to do well to prove themselves, to get a better job? Do they want to rebuild a tool because they've got a lot of frustrated users and they'd like to get less complaints? Um, or perhaps they're just going through the motion because someone else just dumped this on their desk. You know, are they under pressure? What's their relationship with their organization like? Uh, are they being pressured to do things that they don't really want to do? Do they have decision-making authority? It's quite a big one. And if they don't, then how's that going to affect the project and them? Um, you know, it's, it's really important to try to spend the time uh, to understand what makes them tick as people because that's the time you'd spend in a job interview if you were adding a new time, a team member. Um, you know, and you've got to keep on treating them with respect, uh, much like any team member. Um, if someone gives you a bit of feedback and perhaps... Um, it's feedback that you don't feel is entirely appropriate for them to give. If a genuine team member who you respect says that to you, you kind of go, okay, thanks. You, know, you appreciate the fact that they've tried to give you some input. But if you have that conversation with a client where you feel like you're the expert and the client's pushing back on you, it's very easy to kind of let that respect slip and just think, well, why are you telling me what to do? Because you don't know this. You don't know digital. Um, but we wouldn't do that with our own team members um, because the relationship would break down very quickly. And sometimes we need to remember to, to reapply those standards of friendship and trust that we have with our team members uh, to our clients to consider them as a team member. Um, and why should we respect them? Well, you know, they know their organization. Even if they know nothing about digital, client knowledge is genuinely valuable. Uh, they know much more about the sector and context they work in than you probably ever will. Um, they may be taking a risk with you. If their organization isn't really on board with Agile, um, then they may be perceived internally as taking a risk. Um, so that might not be immediately visible, but try to be respectful of that if they're pressuring you to deliver. Because usually when they're pressuring, it's because they're being pressured further up the chain. They will be your ally if you are theirs. You know, clients do want their projects to succeed, and I know it can feel like they don't sometimes. Um, but if you can help them work with their limitations and to achieve their goals, then they will go out of their way to help you to deliver better. Um, but none of this works unless we're honest with them. You, know, you wouldn't lie to a team member. Um, and if something is going wrong or you're having difficulties communicating with them, it's important to be upfront about that and have a proper, serious conversation about it. Uh, trust is the basis of any strong team, and we need to keep on remembering that. 
Cool. So, uh, investing time to educate. Misunderstandings about the Agile process was another of our complaints. Uh, clients weren't really getting involved. They thought it was a developer thing. Uh, they didn't really appreciate the value of why Agile was good for their projects. Um, and we decided that we needed to spend more time actually teaching them about why those things were important um, and also helping them to get the rest of their organization on board with Agile thinking. Um, because even clients who come to you and say, hey, I, I want to do an Agile thing, often don't really understand what that means. Um, or it might be that they don't understand the particular flavor of what it is you're delivering. Or it might be that they just have absolutely no idea what Agile is and they've approached you for another reason. So there's a lot of space for education here. And the reason that it's difficult when they don't understand those things is that clients have stakeholders that they are accountable to. Um, and they need to justify your approach when they have discussions with them. They're going to need to advocate for you when you aren't around. And if they don't really understand why you're doing things in an agile way, then they're not going to be able to have those conversations uh, about value. You know, that value will get lost in translation. Um, you know, so they need to be able to understand why agile is better for their project, what you're committing to and why, what you're not committing to and why, um, you know, what the language means. And they need to be able to say why agile is less risky, you know, how it can be more effective to the project. Um, and it's very often that we don't really spend the time to make sure clients understand that stuff properly. Um, so we decided to help to teach them, to teach their stakeholders and colleagues, uh, to give them the language and tools to be able to advocate for us when we weren't there and for the project. So uh, to get some context for this, it's important to understand whether or not their stakeholders are actually on board. If they are, then bonds are good. Um, if they are not on board, then what are their concerns? Is it about the delivery method? You know, is it agile or is it the project? Um, if they've got concerns, can we speak to them together as a team unit uh, to alleviate some concerns? Um, but regardless, what message should we be communicating to them? Um, we have the pleasure of dealing with ministers quite a lot in our work because we're dealing with central gov. Um, and that, they are just like the ultimate invisible stakeholders. We never get to speak to them, but they often are product owners in a really unhelpful way. Um, so, yeah. uh, so when we have to deal with that, we, we spend quite a lot of time with our client contacts doing things like uh, making slide decks, um, helping them to write emails, uh, helping to get quotes out of usability testing to make the argument that we want to make as a collective to push the conversation forward. Um, so even though we can't kind of engage with those people directly, to make it easier, we can give the client the tools to be able to do that. Um, it's important to dedicate some proper time to clients. Um, you know, they need to understand the day-to-day -day decisions that you're making or hopefully making with them, and they need to see the actual value of Agile in action. Um, and you should also try to be involved them in the design process because that's, that's the decision-making process too, right? So, we decided to extend our sprint plan meetings to a full day. It's a bit hairy sometimes. You get a little bit tired and grumpy by mid-afternoon. Um, but we managed to get most of the key stakeholders in the room for at least the first or second sprint plan. And that can mean up to eight or nine people in a room together, including the developers. Um, but very often, we have the, you know, the client contact and their boss and the procurement guy and Bob from accounting who has specialist knowledge about this thing that we're doing and you know, all of those things together. And it really sets a collaborative tone for the beginning of a project. And it also helps to make sure that in those very first decisions we make, everyone's on the same page with why we made them. Um, so we don't have that, like, why did you decide to make that box pink discussion? Because they were there when we decided it. Um, and similarly, we, we do a similar thing with co-design and, and work, workshopping to get them together to kind of agree on solution designs. Uh, we very rarely sit in the office and design something and then send it back to them. That almost all happens uh, client-facing. Uh, we speak to them every day during a sprint, uh, every day remotely during a sprint. Um, so we use Pivotal for story management. We expect quite a lot of them during our sprints. Um, you know, we, we need them to check in on Pivotal every day. We need them to look at what's been delivered. We need them to give us feedback if they're not happy with it or sign it off if they are. Um, we also require um, a half a day to a day on the final day of the sprint to do any final wash up with us, ideally on site, uh, so that we can get code pushed on the final day. So, 
the final thing that we did, um, and the final problem that we had was, was conflicts over product design. Um, and I thought about this a lot because as uh, at the, I mean, when I originally joined the company, I, I was a designer developer. Um, and uh, I thought about our decision-making process and how I felt when someone gave me feedback. Um, and I decided that the decision-making that we had was much too opinion-based. You know, someone had an opinion here, I had an opinion here, and none of them really met in the middle because they were just opinions. Um, it wasn't focused enough on the goals. So we decided to focus on strategy over solutions. And it can be difficult to make sure that you're both reaching for the same goals. Uh, if you think about the clients you have right now, do you really understand what their goals are? You know, not just the features of the product, but right now, could you tell me the top three things that they want to achieve with that product outside of the kind of digital space? Because uh, I realized that I couldn't answer that question most of the time. Um, and clients, so some clients just don't have strategy, and that's also really important to know up front. Because clients lacking strategy will always focus on their features over their strategic goals because they don't have any. Um, and that's going to lead to conflict, right? Because you want to build something that's amazing, but a client's going to insist on doing things a certain way because that's just what's in their head and that's what they're running off. Um, you know, and we get back into that opinion-based <coughs> design space. So as a policy now, we establish what the client's strategy is. Or we work with them to create at least a basic one. And there's only really two simple questions that you need to have answers for to be able to think somewhat strategically about what you're doing. Uh, the first one is, what are they actually trying to achieve? You know, what is the overarching purpose of their organization and the project within that organization? And the second one is, what does a good outcome look like for them? You know, what would be a successful bit of project? Um, more than the features, but what should the project actually be achieving? <coughs> These two things give you the power to ask this question. How do these features further our goals? And when you get that funny belly feel that actually they're asking you to do something that is just pointless, usually they won't have an answer to this question. And you won't either because it is just pointless, right? So this understanding of strategy gives you the power to push back on them. What gives you even more amazing power is uh, research and data. Um, you know, it will give you the power to make informed decisions and uh, adding more user research to the work that we did really did revolutionise um, you know, the way we did things and stopped us from having so many arguments. Data has this amazing power to make decisions impersonal. Um, you know, we're no longer in that opinion-based space. So, you know, of the projects you've got running at the moment, uh, what do you know about the users? You know, who are they? What research has been done? Do you need to go away and do some more before you can start making those really informed decisions that are more than opinions? Have you planned to embed research into the process? You know, user research and usability testing and analytics, these are all super amazing, awesome tools, um, but we often forget to put them in our proposals, in our project plans, um, and actually we need to be planning for that stuff right from the very beginning, uh, in part to set expectations with clients. And this one's a really important one. How will you measure the success of the features that you're designing now? You know, when you've built them, how are you going to measure that they're successful and that they're meeting the aims of your goals? And this is useful in any project, but it's particularly powerful for agencies. Because as an agency, in, in, when you get into this space, your outcomes are no longer measured against opinions. Right? They're measured against the real metrics that you agreed with the client. They're measured against uh, real things, you know, success or failure. You're getting, you're, it's not about the CEO's color palette anymore. Um, so this is a really powerful thing, both for us as companies and also for, for project spaces. So I uh, started this talk by kind of discussing the problems that we had, the, the slightly more detailed ones. Um, we had mismatched expectations, uh, and we found that with consistent expectation setting at all of our client touch points um, and defining our process better with them, they were no longer kind of surprised or disappointed with the way that things went. Um, we spent more time with clients to get over the misunderstandings that they had about the agile process. Uh, they understood why we do things the way we do, and they understood why their projects were better off with agile. And we really stopped having adversarial relationships with clients because we were working collaboratively as a team. You know, there was much more trust on both sides. And most importantly for us, clients began to advocate for us inside their own organizations. 
Um, and with that, we got much less of the pressuring to be cheaper and faster and doing things the way that the CEO wanted to do it because we'd really made you know, friends and advocates inside the company. And uh, finally, we uh, managed to get over conflicts about product design by agreeing a strategy and sticking to it. So because we're both delivering to that same strategy that was mutually agreed, we're not being held to personal design preferences anymore or you know, the features that Bob from accounting wants. Um, and we're being measured for real success or failure. Um, so just a quick recap. What worked for us was we select clients who we can align goals with. We set expectations early and we reinforce them regularly. We invest time to educate and understand our clients' experiences. And we agree focus on strategic priorities over features. Um, and we're not perfect. We're still learning. Um, but we've come a really long way. Uh, so hopefully some of this was useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, how do you estimate? What happens when you go over the maximum project? That's a good question. Um, so over the, the maximum in the range, yeah. um, it's uh, one of the things that we reinforce uh, throughout the journey is that the client is, for the most part, in control of that. Um, if they decide that they need that feature set, having no, knowing what the estimation is, um, and, uh, and if they decide they really need that feature, then that's a decision that they are making. It's not the one that we're forcing on them. Um, obviously, estimations can be hit or miss, and whether or not you should even be using them is, is a very valid conversation to have. Um, I think you do have to do it in an agency context uh, because you have to set some. You, know, you have to be able to have that discussion to say, is this in or out? Um, and an estimation is, is really the easiest way of doing that. Um, but again, early on, we had a lot of problems with clients going, um, you said you'd do eight stories, and you, know, you haven't managed to do the last story you know, in the sprint, so you should do it. Um, and because we hadn't set expectations well enough, uh, we didn't really have the oomph to push back on that and go, well, we told you about this, and it was in our contract, and it was in our document that we send you, and we also spoke about it at three different meetings. Um, but once we started to do that regularly and remind them and spend more time with them, um, it just became less of an issue. They, they knew that we wouldn't necessarily deliver everything, and uh, you know, well, they might be a bit disappointed. They were generally happier with the quality of everything else that we were doing. Does that answer your question? I was kind of thinking, particularly at the proposal stage, where yeah. you, you have this maximum minimum value, obviously you look at it, agree. Sure. How do you get to those values? Um, so our proposal structure is a set of epics, um, and those epics are based on some kind of discussion with them. Um, those are roughly estimated. They are also, um, you know, this to this values. Um, and they're based on other things that we have done. Obviously, we state our assumptions as much as we can based on those discussions, and our quotes are, as ever, based on you know, those assumptions being correct. Um, but it is, uh, it is somewhat of a process of making sure that we understand the strategic goals so that we can map the epics around those um, so that we get to the core of what they actually need rather than all of those finicky features that they might ask for otherwise. Um, uh, so in, uh, generally, that's, that's been fine, you know, and people appreciate us spending the time pre-sale to go through those strategic needs with them as well. Um, if you were to put yourself into the mindset of like, your company at the very start of everything, yeah. so you have no um, <coughs> very few previous projects, and you have no yep. before with, with the current clients, yep. have, um, no, people don't know about you, people mm -hmm. don't know whether to trust you or not, and, sure. kind of um, and you have no marketing department as well. What would be your... Um, uh, so? Imagining that every single client that comes your way might be the last client you catch wind of for another two months. Sure. And you absolutely have to get that client. Um, are there any things that you feel that you would then fudge on? Um, in, in, ter in, terms of, in terms of the core set of principles yeah. that you're, you're looking at, is there anything that you think you would say, I, I would probably let this one slide or sure. let that one slide sure. over the others? Um, I... I think that depends a bit on your business model and the skills that you have in-house and you know, what your team constructions are and what it is your clients need. Um, it's difficult to kind of judge that for, for sure. Um, but I would say that, um, I, I know it doesn't feel like this right now, and I, and I freelanced and had a small business for a long time before I worked at DXW as well, um, picking, taking the client 
just because they're in front of you is not always, it, it has reputational risks, um, it has impacts on your team, and you need to be really super sure that it's literally like do or die to, to actually get into that place where you feel like you need to compromise. Um, and you will inevitably like get that wrong at least 15 times, and I did that more than that, you know, and I probably still will. Um, but uh, it is kind of, it's a fallacy based on reasonable panic when you're in a small company um, that if you don't take this client, even though you know them to be kind of not a good fit for you, that everything's going to burn. Because actually, you might just be swapping those problems for another set of problems. Um, so, it, like you will, you know. Obviously, we have to. Um, as much as I say, you, you end up selling process when you're doing agile. Obviously, the point of being agile is to be flexible, and we do change our process as we go, and we do improve it, and we do change it per particular client if we think there's a really genuinely good use case for that. But setting a clear expectation up front about what we do do, and then choosing to make compromises rather than making them on the back foot, is probably the best advice I could give. Um, you know, because we got into that space where every compromise we made was sort of by accident because we panicked. Um, you know, so decide what it is you want to do and how you want to deliver it. And then if you make that conscious decision, then at least you can say to the client, we're doing this for you because we think you're awesome, not, um, oh, fuck, fuck this up, shit. Um, yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll do it, we'll do it. Which is, you know, where you can get to sometimes, unfortunately. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. yeah um, so I really agree that strategy is uh, over features, is super important. Yeah. Can you give me an example of how you dis uh, define to the client what strategy is? So do you use like a job to be done type sure. metaphor or a mission statement or what? So a mission statement. We have uh, vision statements, in fact, uh, that go in our proposals. Um, and you know how, how strategic they are will vary, honestly, depending on the nature of the project. Um, but they will set down some kind of broad goal that someone wants to achieve. Um, and there's kind of a hierarchy of that then. Uh, so we have the vision should be at the very top. The epics are then going to describe broadly how we you know, achieve that vision. And then the stories are the things that we're going to deal with in sprint plan meetings to be able to kind of you know, knock that out. Um, but yes, we do. We, we agree on or get sort of reword from them um, a, a, a broad vision type strategy to be able to start as a starting point. Anyone else? Um, there's lots of good tips in there. Mm. What would you say are your top tips for addressing the problem of the remote client not being on site and part of the team? Spend more time with them on site, but like not necessarily your site. Um, uh, structure in time that you actually, are, you're going to set the expectation up front that these days will be spent together. Um, for us, the first day of the sprint is a sprint plan, so we go on site with them. Um, and the last day of the sprint, we ask that they spend half a day with us on site uh, or over Skype if they can't do that. Um, and we also spend time to workshop stuff with them, and that's generally on site with them as well. Um, so having, rather than kind of um, having the, you've just got to be together all the time, and if you're not, then it's kind of a bit fudgy, which doesn't work out. Uh, we just say these are the days that we definitely are going to need to spend with you, and we'll, we can put those in the calendar like three months in advance once we know. You, you, you said you uh, uh, pulled your sprint plan out to eight or to a full day. Yeah. How long are your sprints? Uh, eight days. Um, well, it, it depends. Um, we've got WordPress teams, and they have eight days elapsed over ten days because they have uh, uh, support time in the mornings. Our Ruby on Rails team has a full ten-day sprint. Um, but yeah, but I mean, we also have two day, two weeks breaks between sprints to do things like usability testing. So you know, that that's one full day meeting a month. Um, the amount of stakeholders in stuff tends to go down over time as they get more confident of our ability to make good decisions. Um, so the first two or three sprint plan meetings will have all the serious grown-up people in them, and then after that we'll have the kind of uh, you know, the, the closer client contacts with, with that we've got a bit of a stronger relationship with. Anyone else? Cool. Rock on. Thank you very much, guys.